Episode 295 of the TV Dudes, recorded August 12th, 2020. Ye old business. This week, New TV has let us down, so we are diving back into the bag for some old business. We're going to talk Jet on Cinemax, the finale of Stargirl over on CW, and Season 5 of Better Call Saul on AMC. But before we get to all that, I'm Randy. I'm Kyle. I'm Les. And we are the TV Dudes. Yeah, guys, uh, we, we added a network this week. We decided to dive in. I know that uh, if you show me there's a show that has Carla Gugino as a cat burglar, I'm going to watch that. <laughs> but it's over on Cinemax, which who watches Cinemax. So right. we, we added it to, yeah. to our Hulu package for a month. And uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Cinemax, it's a tricky one. My sister got me hooked on that show, The Nick, a couple yeah. of years ago. The Nick is like uh, their prestige Soderberg, TV. Right? Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, and... You get watching that, and you're like, man, maybe I need this subscription. Like, can it be? No. No, no more subscriptions. Yeah. I watched both the Outcast uh, at one point when I had a, a weird month of, of oh, Cinemax. I actually uh, did buy it for fun. that. I was, yeah, but I was into that one. Didn't grab me. They've, I mean, we talk about this a lot with various streaming services where, yeah, they're starting to get a tone or you're making really good television, but mm-hmm. there is so much TV right now that you haven't quite clicked. Like, the amount of really great Amazon shows that just don't, yeah. quite really hit the bell and 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 ring out and for you you know well and then uh, i feel like that's how i feel at cinemax cinemax has uh, as i looked at it they've got warrior which is like a xcia is- thing with melissa george from alias who I, I like and they had something else that less that you mentioned that was another like female fronted action show i think and then they have um uh strike back which is just a pretty solid action show and they've got um, uh, uh, Banshee. Warrior, I think you you may be thinking of a different show. Uh, it's called it's called no, it's not Warrior. It's um, I mean, it's something Warrior else. is on Cinemax. Warrior well. is something else uh, on Cinemax. Yeah. Um, and Warrior, I, I'm actually I haven't gotten a chance to watch yet, but I'm glad we still have Cinemax for a minute. Uh, just because I've been looking forward to this, we interviewed uh, Rich Ting, uh, one of the actors that's in this, a, a while back when like he had just been announced, and I believe he is. Uh, like the whole thing is a Bruce Lee concept of a show that he never got to make. Oh, right. That's right. And so it is very much like, I think they shot the whole thing in Korea. Uh, Justin Lin is executive producing it. Uh, the entire show I believe is about the, uh, Tong Wars in San Francisco in California in the 80s. Right, right. Yeah. Where they had, they had all of these Chinese immigrants and a martial arts prodigy who fights a fucking mob. And did uh, you guys? Do you guys ever watch anything of any of Banshee? I've watched about uh, a season, uh, season and a half, I think. I've watched about a season of Banshee, and I—that's the same guy that ended up uh, as Cassidy on, um, yeah, Preacher. And I love it, him. I mean, despite Preacher's problems, I love him. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. It's like it's like a weird pulp, but the mob is Amish, and there's there's like amnesia and crime. It's such a strange show. <laughs> but I think the niche I discovered, and we'll talk about Jet specifically later, but. Cinemax seems to be doing this sort of action movie, but they're still got their their Cinemax DNA. So there's always like unnecessary, uh, unnecessary violence, unnecessary nudity. And don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of nudity, but they they definitely push it too far. And also, um, it's lurid. It, it's lurid, yeah. And it's, it reminds me a little bit of what Stars does. It's just like it's not bit. quite. Oh, yeah. It's a little bit not quite where I want it to be. It's like you guys are like HBO if you were skeevy. Little, well, they are HBO skeevy. I mean, HBO and Cinemax used to come as a package yeah. deal where, where like you went to your cable subscriber and like, oh, you got HBO. We'll throw, Cin- we'll, we'll hand you five dollars if you'll take Cinemax. And <laughs> with HBO. It's like the little brother of the person you want to hang out with, the teenage brother. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. And so, uh, so like when we sat down to watch Cinemax this time, and I was like, okay, so right now HBO's got new shows coming out on just HBO, mm-hmm. which is different from the new slate of shows coming out on HBO Max. Correct. And that is different 
from Cinemax, yep. even though I'm pretty sure that is still owned by HBO. Yeah, eventually they'll all collapse into one singularity, I'm sure. Right? Uh, but I don't yeah. Know. Maybe they're diversifying to like increase profits. <laughs> the Illuminati, lizard people. I like to think that there's an algorithm that just looks for number of tits, and like if it's above a certain, <laughs> and like it just gets kicked to cinema. Like, well, where did this you go know, on the lineup? Like, oh man, that's Cinemax now. The algorithm tagged it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're like, yeah, you're like Game of Thrones is HBO, but if you had a little bit more nudity and sex, if any it's of those dicks had show. been hard. <laughs> yeah, I um, I definitely, you know, Les, you've talked in past weeks about how, you, how the anime stuff, you're just like, it's like, it's not that I don't, it's not that I don't want to see, like, boobs and, and nudity, it's that it feels skeevy in the way you're presenting, like, I don't want it here, I want it a separate thing, that's kind of how I feel about yeah. Cinemax's action shows, I'm like, I feel embarrassed that I'm watching this, if someone came in and found me watching this, I'd feel like I got caught watching porn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, I promise Shannon Tweed's not in this. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to talk about Jet. We're going to talk about. Uh, we're also going to talk about the complete opposite of Cinemax, which is CW. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about Better Call Saul, which is on AMC, which is a whole other branding discussion. But before we talk about all of that, it is time for the power rankings. <laughs> You know what? You know the. You know what we're doing here, people. All right. <laughs> Each week we comb through the seedy underbelly of IMDb, Metacritic, Rotten Tomatoes, and we figure out the definitive opinion that the internet has on all the TV that we watch. And it's usually uh, weird. This really is, is. Yeah. And it's unfortunately is, law. <laughs> it is law. It's. It's kind of like that spider cocktail where you would just do a little bit of every soda at the uh, the drink fountain. Oh, so uh, I heard, the, I heard that called a suicide. No, it's called a suicide, oh, yeah. which is just awkward as I get older. <laughs> spider cocktail is when you do that at a bar with different liquors. Oh. Because uh, it's like when the bottle has spider webs on it, you pour that little tiny bit at the bottom out. Oh, Jesus. Uh, and that makes one drink, the, the spider web drink. But anyways, I thought, we're, I thought we're that was, away from the point. I thought that was called a coma. <laughs> Four it, horses. It, it can be, yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, we uh, each week we like to uh, just touch back on the shows that we talked about last week and see where they fell into our ranking. And we are up to a, 109 shows for the year. We've watched a lot uh, of TV this year, guys. I know. It's. Do you think it's uh, more been because s- we've been locked inside? I think I it's about less to say. Than I mean, there's year. been so much going on. I honestly, I would hate. I want to believe that. I'm going to say that we're watching more TV because we're all home, and I am going to steadfastly refuse to look at the amount of television I watched last year in a <laughs> society. <laughs> because I really it is think quite it comparable. <laughs> it was probably more. It was probably more. So, uh, again, this isn't a perfect science, which is made evident by our number three show from last week, which is Transformers War for Cybertron over on Netflix. Which we all which really fell liked. in our. Yeah, it fell in our 78th spot, and that's because of a big zero on uh, Metacritic, which is something that pretty commonly happens, but not Does, with new shows. Now, Metacritic is an aggregator, right? Doesn't it get reviews from various sites? It's kind of like Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, I believe there is some of that. I think they also have uh, like user-generated rankings. Uh, I'm probably using their aggregated score, but the thing that really messed up the search for me on this one is uh, there's also a game called Transformers War for Cybertron. Oh. And there is a ton of information about that game all over Metacritic. But oh, that I couldn't makes find, sense. Yeah, I couldn't find I'll one page real. for the show. Transformers decades of fucked up naming conventions makes it <laughs> really difficult to find <laughs> the current uh, Transformers. I call it the animated Spider-Man problem. It's true. <laughs> Find also, the animated Spider-Man you mean to watch. I gotta say, I'm I'm a little surprised given that the internet are uh, one of the one of the truisms of the power rankings is that animated shows tend to rank higher. I'm surprised Transformers is ranked so low. Yeah, but it may be the that, it may be the game issue that's causing the, the confusion. It also it's had a hundred percent on Rotten lips. Tomatoes, so like people like this show. Yeah, they um, just hate Megatron's lips. Yeah, no, I think it's the zero that's uh, that's skewing it. That's why it gets a big insufficient stamped on it. Um, we'll touch base. I'll uh, I'll take a, another look next time I update the sheet. And I think by the um, end of the but, year, Kyle, you have to you have to do a big pass through and, and update everything. Just, it's oh, just yeah. a big and update at the end of the year. I I usually go pretty deep with like the top thirty. Yeah, and then after about thirty of them, it's like I'm gonna go get a drink. I'll come back <laughs> <this> later. <laughs> I'm gonna January make myself a spider first. cocktail. 
yeah. the top ten shows are allowed to remain accessible, and all the other shows <laughs> will be wiped from the hard drives of the data centers globally. Just like the Parks and uh, Rec reunion. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's sad. It's actually that. That's like a show topic in itself. Like the TV that we can't find anymore. That yep. like show that it's not online. You can't buy a DVD. Carlo Gugino like, is in my is my Holy Grail show. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Karen Cisco. Karen Cisco. I haven't looked super hard for it. Maybe on YouTube, for all I know. <laughs> um, I'm just saying, man. I found the Remo Williams pilot. <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> you want it's to talk all about out a there. Problematic character. <laughs> if you look hard enough. Um, Something that uh, also has that naming convention problem is Muppets Now over on HBO oh, yeah. Max. Yeah. Yes. Tied with uh, Hollywood on Netflix in the 74 spot. So not much higher than Transformers, and it's got all its scores intact. Just not beloved. Mm. Yeah, no. Uh, and we, we weren't super We weren't super sold. It? There's only one yeah. so far, so maybe it'll... Uh... I, I did hear that Danny Trejo is in episode two. That's going to at least get me to watch a second episode. Ooh. Oh, I will definitely watch a Danny Trejo episode. Yeah, <laughs> you've sold me as well. Um, so then up a little higher, but still kind of uh, kind of low on our list, not even breaking the top 50, is Umbrella Academy season two over on Netflix. And that's, not, 47. That, that's not missing any scores, is it? No, actually, it's uh, number 46. It's tied with devs over on FX. Uh but I'm, yeah, the, I'm su- I'm not, I guess I'm not super surprised because I did hear some mixed reactions to Umbrella Academy. I heard some people saying mm-hmm. they thought the second season wasn't as good, but it is a little weird. Wrong, but those people are wrong. But yeah, yeah, I think th- I think one of the things that's great about that show is how weird it is. But we're still blowing through it right now, and it's like all the plot points in that show. I just feel like keep you coming. Like you got to turn on that next episode. It's, it's a, great. The wait, soundtrack's great. All of it's great. And I spent half of it yelling at Allison. I mean, like, just screaming <laughs> at my TV. Um, and I still Les, loved it. You will be happy to know that our patron, Mandy, who is, keeps subjecting you to anime, agrees with you about Allison. <laughs> in, Somebody else texted... Nick Tice reached out to me via text and was like, you're fucking right. Allison's in fact, I, I've talked to somebody else. I can't remember. It might have been Nick at the store. I believe everyone is on team is on team. Les is right about Allison. I continue to hold out the poor Allison. The rumor... I heard a rumor she's not so bad, guys. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. I heard a rumor your spleen exploded. I mean, I heard a rumor you were nice. <laughs> so, let, uh, I, Kyle, have you, have you gotten through it yet or how far are you in? Um, let's see. I think I might only have three left. I think I might be on episode seven. Okay. All right. Actually, you know what? No, I might be on six because the next episode, well, I don't want to spoil anything. Oh, there's some crazy shit coming for Kyle. Yeah, there is. (laughs) Yeah. No, I've already gotten, uh, (laughs) like kind of, uh, like a crow when I realized some of the things I said last week, like you guys already (laughs) knew that I was wrong, which you were just, you know, humoring me. Yes. Um, I can't wait for you to finish out the season. It's bug shit nuts. I love it. Yeah. It's crazy. Nah, we are, uh, we're pretty invested and we've been watching a few of them every night. Outside of my normal critic schedule. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was uh, a little surprised to not see that a pinch higher. But yeah. I think that also has to do with like, there's just so much TV out there right now. Yeah. Was that it? Was that everything Everything new for this week? Yeah, we just talked three shows last week. All so right. So now 109 shows for the year. Stay tuned. Yeah. So uh, just a reminder, you can support us by going over to patreon.com slash TV dudes. Throw us a buck an episode and in exchange, you get to keep uh, we get to keep up with our streaming services. We get to pay for our hosting costs and you get bonus content each week. Uh, last week, we talked about Samara Weaving and some of her films. This week, we are going to talk a tribute to Keanu Reeves uh, leading into the Bill and Ted's Ooh. trilogy. Whoa. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about uh, his his growth as an actor, where he started, where he is right now, his uh, his role as that guy in 2019, where he's played himself in like four different things, and mm-hmm. uh, we're going to use that to lead into a Patreon trilogy where we're going to talk about Bill and Ted, Excellent Adventure, Bogus Journey, and then the new Face the Music, which is going to hit on demand at the end of August. So uh, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about his comics. We're going to talk about nice. uh, his band Dog Star for at least a 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, all that, so yeah, you get that. You can get that episode and all our past Patreon content just by doing a dollar a week. And uh, if you want to go higher, you can become a showrunner, which is a twenty dollars level. If you get the twenty dollars level, you can pick two shows to put on our radar. Uh, usually, they're anime because people want to make us like anime. In fact, <laughs> Mandy Cocott, who is one of our uh, patrons, who've uh, put us on Kill a Kill and and had to listen heartbroken as uh, less. 
Uh, she felt like she had broken less. Uh, she, uh, I'm so glad nobody's ever picked the OA. She's trying. <laughs> she's bad. Don't she's do trying. That. She, she her goal. Okay, so last week she she messaged me. She hadn't listened to the podcast. She's like the the title of the show is making me so happy, and I, I didn't have the heart to tell her. Oh, that was that was my Transformers. <laughs> Um, but like we're only has, getting in on a technicality by the corporate filing of Netflix. Yes, and, she, and Mandy has spoken, and she's officially said that is not anime; it doesn't count. Yes. But her goal is to get you get you less to actually like an anime, and so she has picked our second anime, and that is Carol and Tuesday, which I believe is by the creators of Cowboy Bebop, and uh, sounds like maybe a little less pervy and a little bit more about the future of music. Uh, and it I'm, looks I'm, like a two girl band. I'm looking at images of it, and it, it looks pretty cool. So we're gonna check that out. But before we get to that, uh, Tyler Thorson has requested that we watch Dark Side of the Ring over on Vice via Hulu, and we're gonna talk that next week. Nice. I'm really looking forward to that. I've heard it described kind of like criminal, uh, but in the space of like uh, professional wrestlers. Yeah, which sounds right up my alley. I'm totally for that. <laughs> So this week, weirdly, is all old business, which we usually do top of the show, but we're going to do end of the show. So I'm going to start by, and this is all spoilery stuff because this is all completed shows, so uh, if you haven't watched one of these, you might want to skip over. But let's start off by talking about Stargirl over on CW, which we've talked about once or twice already, but now it has wrapped its first, what, 13-episode season? Um, it felt really short. But I think it's just because I was loving every episode. Uh, yeah, I'm, but yes. I'm just glad. I'm just glad they didn't do the 13. CW. Tw- they didn't do the 22 episode thing CW usually does, which I no, feel like they would have had a stronger. seventh inning stretch. There would have been three or four <laughs> episodes around number 17 that would have been uh, maybe good one offs, but not contributing to the larger plot. It's just the yeah. nature of how that's structured. Instead, uh, it's one big story. It works really well. I feel like it's drawn a lot oh, from the Stars and Stripe comic, and I thought they nailed it. This may be my favorite they did CW a show. Fantastic job with this finale. Uh, Kyle, I don't know how much of the season you've gotten to see at all. I know you saw the pilot, right? Definitely the pilot. I think I got three or four episodes in. Um, so a little bit of them building the Justice League team? Yeah, just like at their, the start of that. Kids. Yeah, once, they, once so they, they built their new Justice Society, that was where the show really took off. Yeah, they really oh, get their Justice Society going. Like, it's The only problem I have with this is kind of a similar problem I had with like Buffy Season 1, mm-hmm. where they don't the wire work is a little off uh there's there's times yeah. where they use a lot of wire work in their fights and you can tell that someone is suspended and kind of bouncy above the ground sure and particularly in wildcat where i'm like i know what you're trying to do but don't yeah uh, <laughs> on the other and, hand occasionally and, they nail it like we talked about the star girl oh, and yeah. uh uh not, what's her name it's a uh, spike uh, shiv Spur, shiv, shiv. <laughs> yeah uh, uh carrie burnham uh no, God, what is her I name? I forget Cindy the Burnham. name. Yeah, yeah, Cindy, Cindy Burnham. Burnham. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, there, there are times where the fights are fantastic, but there's a few times where it's, you know, it's a TV show doing effects budgets. I remember the fights in Buffy drastically improving mm-hmm. uh, and into season two, and I'm really hoping that there's a few little minor things that they'll work out. Overall, the choices they make are really mm-hmm. what, what make this for me, where I loved Runaways at the jump, but then mm-hmm. it really, really came off the rails for me mid-season of season yeah. one really um and got just ridiculously dumb and stupid with a very similar setup mm-hmm. big secret device underneath the ground like right. underneath the town and all the secret plan here it actually worked this was one of the first times where i was watching a tv show where the villains plan both felt comic booky yeah and also felt believable in the world they'd set up the weirdest I'm thing i'm not for saying me... it's believable in the real world no 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 but, but in, it, in the superhero it, world. it's believable in the america and the world of star girl that blue valley might exist that these villains might do this and set this up here like the and weirdest, it felt really the weirdest thing for me was that there was their plan was like they were going to realign everybody's brains <laughs> using brainwave and i was like I'm kind of on board this. Like they were going to make like every, everyone was going to believe in climate change and va- vaccines, uh, and I'm like they were going to end racism and gender despair, like uh, any discri- discrimination on gender or sex or race, and they were going to embrace solar and wind and, and eating healthy. 
And the only downside was they were going to kill one out of four people they reprogrammed. A quarter of the people. Also, though, I, I kept thinking, like, this is why – this is what I love about villain plans, like yeah. like Injustice Society. You know those guys think that they are ending Injustice somehow. <laughs> but that's the thing. Like, like I, That's why I had trouble buying it. I'm like, these guys have been pretty sinister throughout, everybody. Well, and, like, why would they be – like, I can't believe these guys would be – you can't tell me Sportsmaster was like, I'm really concerned about racism. No. No, no, no. <laughs> I, and that's why I think, like, this was uh, – this was Icicle's plan because of the yeah. death of his wife. Right. And and even if Stargirl hadn't stopped it, if we'd seen this work, I guarantee that Brainwave was not following the script. Right. On what to report. There's no way you can trust Henry King no, that to guy's do this a altruistic psychopath. bullshit. He's yeah. going to kill all of the people if he could. I mean, he would yeah. just kill the country if he could. Yeah. Uh, there's, no, I mean, I get the feeling like, you know, uh, Gambler definitely was going to rob the country, but like, if, mm-hmm. if he could, if the gambler could insert a bit in the script uh, that Henry's programming them with that says, "Also, you should donate money to this. Everybody mm-hmm. should send a dollar to the gambler." You <laughs> yeah. know, he fucking would. Mm-hmm. And so, there's there were a lot of moments where I was like, I I feel like even though this isn't on screen, as a comic book nerd, I feel like they get that these characters are still fucking villains. Like this was really not going to work. I would have they, liked, they I would have liked to have seen scary. that. I would have liked to yeah. have seen that. I would have liked to have seen a little bit of the infighting that because we saw they, they killed the, the, the fiddler and I would yeah. have liked to have seen a little bit more of that. And they hate okay. each other. I mean like, all, yeah. I mean they killed the wizard too. Like, yeah. I love that they outright dislike each other. Yeah. And with the, uh, the tease we get at the, at the very end for next season, we see that, <sighs> there were some other members of the Injustice Society that maybe didn't think Icicle's plan was so slick. Yeah, so I thought they did a great job of, like... Uh, first of all, let's talk about the Seven Soldiers of Victory. These guys mm. went deep. And they had yes, not, they only, not, only the, not only just the Society and Injustice Society, they had the Seven Soldiers of Victory, and Shining Knight makes a, a big part of the story in the last three episodes, and that's great. I thought that what they did with him was really good. I like that character. I like the way they handle him. They don't just have him, boom become shiny knight again right yeah and and kick a bunch of ass they have him have a, a real crisis and yeah. and i like that they end it with an easter egg tease of i'm gonna go find the other soldiers i can't wait for i think season two okay I, let's finish talking about season one because most a lot of my excitement is <laughs> just just watch this about where they're gonna go with season two but uh the the hour man wildcat discussion about whether or not you kill and the Iron Man facing off with, with uh, Solomon Grundy and Stripe facing off with Solomon Grundy and th- who winds up killing and all that I thought was played out beautifully. Yolanda's entire reaction to that was perfect. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I get so angry when people are like, you said something odd. Are you you? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, when somebody's in disguise or something. Yeah. Like, yep. and, and you're like, you stupid. Do you not know the stakes and wh- what's going yeah. on? Right? No, she does know the stakes. She's in yeah. a tunnel. They're about to face their death. If you feel something odd, strike. And she yeah. does, and it's yeah. you see her character living with it, even just in the minutes, yeah, that remain in the episode, and it's it's wild. Yeah, uh, it's really good. It comes back to what she had said to to our man about he's like, yes, I know she killed your parents, but you can't you can't kill him. And then she finds herself in that situation and finds out that she feels differently. And that was really really good and really interesting. Courtney coming upon her at the same time, like there's some real good meat to to, to dive into in season two. Yeah. Yeah. And then Stripe facing facing off with Grundy was so much fun. And then watching watching Grundy tr- take him apart. Oh, literally peel that robot apart yeah. was awesome. And then having Our Man show up and he's like, I got this. The, there, was, there was a line that I thought was just like the perfect. He's like, I got five minutes left and it's all They're for all you. you. Yep. Yeah. I so love good. that. I love Rick. As, I mean, I like Hothead Rick as Our yeah. Man. Yep. It's, it, Our Man was, a, was one of my favorite characters as a kid. Uh, and I, I really like the the whole weird 50 setup of it of like I invented something that makes me basically Superman uh, but I limit it to an hour a day because I know myself and I can't, can't yeah. just have this turned on all the time but I also like that after after all the setup he doesn't kill Grundy and Grundy gets to be this like because okay let's, let's Grundy's talk, just a fucking beast he's just a big animal let's talk a little bit about there. season two and potential things now great now I, I think less you've read Starman right yeah I've read I've read like the the Ted Knight, like the the Starman comics, for, yeah, that weren't yeah. Star Girl, yeah, yeah. So there's a big part of Starman that has a new Solomon Grundy. He like dies and comes back as a more like 
He's friendly different almost beast. every time that they do this to him. But yeah, and I wondered if they're going to do that in season two since they left him alive and they definitely have this sort of get out of here, you know. And I wondered if maybe they're going to go that route because I definitely think they they mentioned uh, Ted Knight in this season as the creator of the mm-hmm. staff. And then they end this season with some amazing Easter eggs. They show the shade showing up, and I, I've yelled out loud at how happy I was to see the shade. I, I, so a, a mutual friend of ours on Facebook talked about making like a squee noise at the <laughs> at one of the Easter eggs, and I know it had to be this one because I made an out loud noise alone in my house. Yeah, I love shade yep. so much. That's such a great. I was actually disappointed and mad, even though I understood why the wizard had to be. Yeah, the uh, one of the main characters in this. He's Justice Society. He is from Star like. Yep. The wizard started the Injustice Society. Yeah. He had to be in this. That said, the wizard and Shade look too fucking similar, yeah. and I don't give a fuck about the wizard. Yep. But Shade is such a great character. Especially because in the comics, he's the depth, similar yeah. to Grundy. He's good yeah. or bad. He's he's really out for Shade. But having set him up, you can't tell me we're not going to see Star uh, Jack Knight in season two because Jack Knight was I, huge in Stars and Stripes. <clears throat> yes, and and I think uh, also one of the other Easter eggs they throw in is that. Uh, Sylvester Pimpleton is still alive. Yeah, which is interesting. But the Easter, egg, the Easter egg that got me, the one that had me saying, oh shit out loud, is the one that didn't belong with the rest of this stuff, that almost belongs mm. in Legends of Tomorrow, and that's Eclipso. So they've that... already introduced Alex. Oh, interesting. Okay. He's not her cousin. He's Yolanda's little brother. He's the only one that stands up for her when her whole family's still slut-shaming her. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. in the comics, he's the only person that manages to, like, contain and control the power of, El- of Eclipso, sort of. Yeah, and Eclipso's like, like a when... dark god of the DC Universe, yeah. Yeah, and I'm hoping that they go... I mean, it's hard to tell. There's so many DC comic reboots. It's hard to tell what iteration of anything they're going to fucking do. Right. But in the comics, if I remember right, Eclipso was so the CW's already done the Spectre. Ollie's the Spectre. Right. Right? They haven't done Eclipso, much with him. Yeah. Eclipso was the Spectre. He was the spirit of vengeance prior to the Spectre. Yeah. And he was much more a spirit of revenge. Yeah. And and enjoyed it. And so like uh I think they say in the comic that like Eclipso caused Noah's flood. Right, uh, yeah. where the Spectre killed firstborn kids. Yeah, like yeah, like the Spectre's a targeted killing vengeance thing. Yeah, and, and Eclipse Eclipse just, just like everything. Yeah, kill it. Yeah, and so yeah, it made total like I, I that threw me off. Like Eclipse is not one of my favorite things from the comics, and so I I didn't I I was still tripping on Shade appearing, yeah. but it makes total sense for Cindy Berman to be the one that's like you know what. I'm angry enough just to throw this bag of shit at everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, Eclipso's not good for anybody. Nobody's no. plan works by using Eclipso as a cog in your plan. Right. Like, mm-hmm. Eclipso possesses you, and you do Eclipso's plan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I was super happy to finally finish this, and I am I am psyched for a season two. I am so psyched. They shoot yeah. this in Vancouver, right? Isn't this, like, CW stuff shoots in Vancouver. Is it possible? Yes, almost all of it. They won't be as delayed, because Vancouver, I think, is back open again. They may well be. Hmm. Uh, I mean, things that shoot outside of the states, I feel like are going to have. I think that's how Marvel is still hoping that their DC or their Disney Plus TV stuff works. Right, uh, is by shooting in uh, Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan or whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm I'm really hoping that that this doesn't delay this for like two years or something and literally age people out of a high school show. Yeah. That'd be crazy uh, if we get a bunch of like Bollywood and just like foreign TV. Stop I, hey man, coming over because we have gaps. I there's think a, that this is going to break. Uh, is finally is what's finally going to tip the uh, the scale for American audiences watching more foreign bought stuff. Just because Netflix is going to find us TV. I've got like five different Korean shows on my to watch list. Now a bunch of them are only on YouTube, but there's like the crime show I want to watch. There's like there's there's good stuff from Korea that's that's just like just been waiting for me to have a slot in my schedule. So yeah. I'm I'm all for bring me some foreign TV, man, and not just British, Kyle. What? <laughs> no, that's the only foreign I know. <laughs> so, uh, we talked about the Easter eggs that that matter for season two, yeah. And and I I can't stress enough that unlike a lot of superhero shows, I did not watch the whole first season, su- surviving purely on Easter eggs, hoping mm-hmm. they'd set up the season two I want. Right. Star Girl did a lot in season one that I loved i can't believe that they just went ahead and showed me dragon king yeah they just went ahead and had 
uh, full on fights in costumes and like yep. they they went ahead and had Brainwave Junior and like it, it's just been great for the whole season one and I am so much more excited for season two. I, and I and they built a lot of trust for me. I agree, uh, and you're right. That's a good point because one of the things the CW shows have always done, in addition to being 22 episodes, is they took so long to get to the costumes and things. And so it's like by the time we get to the stuff I really want, we're in season three, and I'm already a little tired of it. But yeah, this is like this was if this was all they did, one great season, I'd be totally okay with it. Yeah, this this was well done, and the uh, there were Easter eggs in this episode that I've got to mention that don't have any bearing on anything. Right, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a third movie poster, and I cannot, for the life of me, remember. What I can't it was. remember There's either. a moment early in the episode where they're walking up on the movie theater, and the posters for the movies outside. One is just the cover issue of Prez Number One. Mm-hmm. Like I, they, I think they even just use the art, and mm-hmm. then they pull from the graphic novel for Unknown Soldier. I think they use the cover art for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a third. And so, like, just pulling these these DC graphic novels or DC comics, especially Prez, like that's yeah. just, and the marquee great. and the marquee is how to haunted tank. So that's what it was. Haunted tank on the yep. marquee. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, it seriously, if, uh, Oh God, what was the football one in like Cy force and art and all that shit that Marvel had at one oh, point? Kickers like, Inc. Yes. Kickers Inc. Like seriously, if, if, if a Marvel <laughs> show, just had a Kicker's Inc. poster in the background. <laughs> I, that, that would be the level of like, oh my God, Prez. Yeah. <laughs> For me. I would like to touch on uh, Better Call Saul which uh, I, I finally watched season five, which uh, is not anywhere yet. It's an AMC show, so it hasn't dropped to Netflix yet. I've been buying these on Prime because I really love this show, and I finally went and binged through the rest of it. And uh, season five, I don't want to spoil too much. I know, uh, like, last year way behind, and Kyle, you're a little bit behind, but I thought it's one of these shows where I'm like, I was like, ah, I'm not in the mood for this, not in the mood for this. And then I started watching it and, of course, got sucked right into it and binged through the rest of it. Uh, a lot of it is about Jimmy fully endorsing, fully becoming Saul this season. Um, and about Ray, his his girlfriend, who started out as being the one sort of like, you know, just be Jimmy. She liked she liked Jimmy and she was trying to get him to be a... She has definitely gone sort of all in on Saul business now. And it feels like he's ruined her. And he's yeah. starting to see it, but he's also enjoying it. And toward the end of the season, they start contemplating something really dark. And I was like, man, uh, this is brutal to watch because Ray Seahorn uh, plays um, Kim so well. And so I love her and I want her to be I want her to be OK. But I know her role in this is going to be to not be OK. Yeah. yeah. And to not th- be around for Breaking Bad. <laughs> there's a uh, there's a so, like it's a full long episode stretch where Jimmy gets in with this guy from the cartels. He's like the brother of Don Hilario, I think. And. He's this sort of happy-go-lucky Joe Pesci type guy where he seems real happy and then all of a sudden snaps and goes violent. And basically Jimmy winds up being his lawyer and and sort of in his own Jimmy way winds up having to go get money for him. And he winds up – it winds up a story with him and Mike in the desert. having And they've got to get all this money out of the desert while someone's looking to kill them. And it's sort of a survival story. And it's about how much Mike just really doesn't like Jimmy and about how Jimmy will like has, has that cockroach ability to survive. And it's a really great episode. And it plays off Kim, like being worried about him. And it's, it's just one of those is one of the best episodes of Vinicol Saul they've done. And then they wrapped up the season with a couple of other it's, uh There's also some stuff with Nacho where he, their, their guy who we know is probably not going to survive this because we don't see him in better in breaking bad. But, uh, some of his stuff is really dark and really dangerous, and he makes a choice that I think is really going to come back on him next season. It's fascinating, dark, interesting stuff, as always, and I'm super looking forward to another season. Yeah. I'm sure it's all yeah. going to work out fine for him. Oh, yeah, it'll be great. I, it'll be great. He definitely won't want you say tracks. He definitely won't I wind up most... working a Cinnabon. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing that's surprising about this is that they're able to have sustained it for so many seasons. It's almost longer than Breaking Bad at this point, right? Didn't Breaking Bad go seven seasons? Like, they could potentially go as long, which is crazy. 
prior wow. to the show, I could have never fathomed a prequel working for yeah. anything right. working yeah. this well. Yeah. But this show, like, it had, I feel like all the Chuck stuff in the early seasons, mm-hmm. like, had such a good resolution, like, at the end of Chuck's story. Yeah. And then, like, it kind of spawned off, like, this whole new thing, which seems much closer to what we thought we were going to get in those early seasons, mm-hmm. like, the closer to the Saul Goodman yeah. character. Yeah. Um, but, oh, my gosh, the what I've seen of this season of him, like, corrupting Kim, yeah. which, like, at first, because they did it last season, maybe even before that, but, like, where they go out to bars and they, like, con people out of money and they mm-hmm. get drunk and then have sex afterwards. Like, it's a very fun and, like, something you do on the weekends. But, you know, now that, like, Jimmy's all in, uh, it's, like... I can only imagine what's going to happen to her before the end of this series. Like, and break, Breaking Bad is good. Breaking Bad is starting a few, to to pour into it too because we see Huel more than once. We see um, Gus Fring is heavily involved in this, and I still we're going to talk about Jet and Giancarlo, Giancarlo Esposito. I still think Gus Fring is the best role he's ever had, and he's great in it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so and there's there's something I, else too from Breaking Bad that's it's like, but we haven't seen Jesse and we haven't seen Walt yet. But I'd be surprised if we don't eventually. I. I am. Uh, you wouldn't cry. There, there will at least be a moment where somebody's meth cook is putting fucking cayenne pepper in, and somebody <laughs> mentions it. Uh, Jesse's dumb shit from season yeah. one. Yeah. Um, they're, what they're doing now in Saul, I think, is what I thought the whole show would be. Yeah. Which is a bad idea, bad plan, with a guy named Jimmy that gets worse and worse and worse, and inevitably he ends up right at the start of Saul. I mean, mm-hmm. right at the start of Breaking Bad being Saul. Right. And instead, what we got in the first few seasons was this, the whole Chuck thing. and all this. We got an entire separate show, self-contained arc. If you didn't tell anybody it was tied to Breaking Bad, if you'd never seen Breaking Bad, you didn't need to. Yep. It was entirely, mm-hmm. you watched Jimmy get burned by his brother, decide to burn him back. That whole thing was basically self-contained. Mm-hmm. And the man that walked out of it is the guy that... that now can start falling yep. into this bre- and so they they stepped further back than I expected the prequel to go and they made mm-hmm. sure that they didn't just show me the trip and fall into Breaking Bad they showed me what made a guy able to trip and fall yeah. into Breaking Bad I agree yeah uh, and the weird thing is because of how great Michael McKean was and how good the Chuck story was I would have been unsurprised if it had not worked if basically once it was over, uh, it's like, oh, well, it's kind of lost it now. Now I don't care. But it's still good. Yeah. Well, and I think it's because, like, now they've earned all this trust. You know this show's badass. And they're just now getting to the thing that in the back of your mind was the, supposed to be the show the whole time. Yeah. Well, and I feel like you had mentioned the stuff with Nacho. I feel like any time that character's, like, story is being played out, it is just so tense. And you are forced to, like, feel everything that he feels in that moment. Mm-hmm. A lot like uh, like that. Those are the parts of the show that feel the most like Breaking Bad are uh, some of those tense scenes with Nacho. Nacho really works for me because I love that dude and you know he's doomed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just not in the show. I mean, so like a part of your brain's like, I don't know how they explain it, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't go into wit sec and, and get a picket fence. <laughs> that would be a weird ending for any character on this show. That like, would be hysterical if somebody you just assume is dead, especially uh-huh. if they telegraphed it for like a season. And they just find out, no, they lived happily ever. They're in yeah, Indiana. no, he lives in like, <laughs> yeah. He lives in nuclear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about our final show for this, for this week, which is Jet, two, two T's. Uh, over on Cinemax, uh, mm-hmm. which mostly got my attention because it's got Carlo Gugino in it. And uh, it, I started looking up. So this is a show that is is created by, a lot of it is all written, and I think a lot of it is directed by... All Se- of it directed by Sebastian oh, it all? Gutierrez. Okay, Sebastian Gutierrez, who is apparently her boyfriend. I was like, I was how, did, wondering, how, but, how did this guy get this gig? Because I looked up his IMDb, and here's the thing. He wrote, Snakes on, a, he wrote Snakes on yeah. a Plane. He wrote The Big Bounce, which by all accounts was not a great Elmore Leonard no. adaptation. Um, he's done a bunch of shorts and like looks like some some like female driven noir, but like nothing like nothing that's caught on. Nothing you know the name of. He had a six year gap in his career between Hotel Noir and Elizabeth Harvest. I was like, how did this guy get this gig? And I'm like, oh, Gugino's a, a producer on all this, so I kind of she's also in and a producer on Elizabeth Harvest. Okay, so the, basically which is on it, this, this is this is Gugino being like, okay, sure, baby, you can have the show. But what's <laughs> what's weird to me is like. I feel like, and, and I'll, we'll get into it all, as I watch Jet, mostly what I'm feeling is 
I wish this was written and directed by a woman. I f- yes. the male mm-hmm. the male gaze of it and the, the male, male feel of it is really really distracting. And I'll, well, so it's it's weird. It it is partly for what it is doing well, and part like, it is also what it is doing badly. Mm-hmm. Noir. All, and crime noir always, always is walking on a line where it could easily fall over into just misogyny and gross tropes. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and it's part of what I love about well-done crime is this reminder that, like, those ideals still hold and ethics still matter and, and morals still matter even in these gray, mucky, awful scenarios, right? Mm-hmm. And it, unfortunately, if if you lean in, like, this show leans into that real hard... And I don't blame necessarily, like, I don't think Gutierrez is making a gross show. No. But there's not a way, if I directed it, there's not a way for me to not be a dude making this. Exactly. I I feel like... And I wish Gugino had made it with her in the center of it. To some extent, I mean, we talked this a little bit off mic, uh, Les, but this is, this is, Jet is basically Parker. It's Mm -hmm. a female version of Parker, who's this career criminal, Richard Stark. But the thing is... Because Parker's, she's a woman, she accidentally ended up with a fucking child. Because Parker's always a badass, and he's always like he's always in control. And even when he gets brutalized and all that kind of stuff, you know that he's the guy who's going to wind up on top. And he's just like the he doesn't care. He will he will go. He will, he will get come you. back after you for the eleven thousand. I don't need another. I don't need a hundred thousand. You owe me this amount of money. Yeah. Whereas I feel yeah. like Jet's motivation becomes. I've also got to look out for my daughter. I've got to look out for this woman who's my who 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 has a disease. I've got to look out for my uh, lover who gets killed. I've got to I've got to uh, whoa, whoa, you know, she's got to, like I got to throw in my my I've got to use my, use my body against this crime boss and his bro- and she's got to sleep with everybody. I'm like it's all a little bit like this is too much like I am using my 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 sexuality as a weapon. And I'm like. Are you though, or are you just using your sexuality? And that's what that's where it leaves me in a weird place. It's like I. I'm not entirely sold that this is as powerful as they think it is. Yeah, uh, same like here. It, it, I, and I'm not. I'm not entirely sold that it's not. Uh, can I? Can I, I step it yeah. back for a second? Because yeah, Kyle. I, I, was, some, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. I have some really good things to say about it because I think that this pilot is like a master class in like writing a pilot script and. Uh, even just like producing a show that is like bound to get people to like come back and want to watch it more, hmm. it, the turns that it takes, it seemed like probably every page and a half, the power dynamic completely shifts, and the person that you think is in control on screen becomes somebody different. All leading mm-hmm. up to kind of this finale uh, that sets us on our kind of adventure throughout the season. But then for the next couple episodes, I don't feel like. The, those like turns per minute that we got in that pilot episode, those became like maybe turns halfway through the show, and then by the you end, you settle of the show, into a crime a week, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it definitely felt like okay, now we're at our procedural show, except there we're we not go. on a network, we're on Cinemax, so people are. Oh yeah, I have to tell you guys, I witnessed something I've never seen before in television, and I know that I'm going to see it all the time now, but sex position. All right. <laughs> Listen to this word, sex position. <laughs> you know, people okay. people coined that for Game of Thrones, Kyle. No, no, no. Because in this show, there is a scene where before we know who Jet is, she runs into a guy. Maybe he's an old lover. Maybe he's a, a partner or something. But she catches this guy and he's having an affair. She goes, "That's not your wife," you know. Blah blah blah. What's it to you? You know. And then she walks off. The next scene, this guy is having sex with this woman. And they are carrying on a conversation. And what does this woman want to know about? Who is the mysterious woman down in the lobby? Oh, and he's just like pile driving her, <laughs> full nudity. And he's like, yeah, that's my old partner. You know, we did this crime together one time. And it continues to be an entire sex scene where they just give you all the exposition you need to know on who the character Jet is. Yeah, I, it's I, literally her introduction. The, okay, those, those two characters, cop, I feel like, yeah. yeah. I feel like they were unnecessary. The undercover cop and his and his new girlfriend, who's also his partner, mm-hmm. uh, I like. I I didn't care about them whenever they showed up, and I mostly didn't want them there. I feel like yeah. this this show is heavy by about four characters. That's and that's the thing. I don't I don't not like any of the characters. Like yeah. I'm enjoying the cop story, but sure. I'm, I'm yeah. with you. I feel like they pair and and I I don't mind the conceit of. Uh, if Parker had been a woman, the odds mm-hmm. that he would be at some point 
pregnant and una- like and, and end up with a kid. It was, it was like that that to me spoke about like a a gender gap in doing these jobs that like I don't care how tough Jet is, at some point she can be compromised in a way that, that uh um dude can't be. The, look, here's uh, the thing. Female Parker would never have a kid. And female, that's the thing. <laughs> people like, Parker people would be like, Parker oh, I'm pregnant? Well, let me take care of that. Yeah. And and so I, I kind of was waiting for some kind of explanation, a little more than just like I saw the sonogram or something like that. Like, I, you know, as to, as to why she did do, not. Do we get one? At, have, have you watched no, all the way to the end? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I haven't watched all the way to the end. We get the moment in the motel where she meets uh, her her nanny basically that lives with them and and they're basically both making a like well our old lives are over and i guess we make a decision to be a family but it's a little early in the show and i didn't quite buy it i I, it was hard it's hard to sell me on a character that has a secret heart uh but is also cold as fuck everywhere yeah yeah especially when that's tough what I really want is an ice cold blade in the center of this show and everyone mm-hmm. else have to deal with it. Like I would love to see uh, Jet's friends routinely realize that she's not their friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's and the thing. That, that I wa- she's loyal as fuck to you, but doesn't actually care about you. There's, there's so many things I want this to be like, if you, if you had made her Constantine, if you had made her Parker, if you had done this more like Ocean's Eleven, if you had done this yeah. more like, um, there's there's a few other things that I'm like it could have been, it could have been this. If you made it Fletch, for God's sake, like there's any number of tones you could make it darker, you could make it lighter. But I feel like it's it wants to be both. It wants to be light and dark at the same time. It wants to have this heart, and it feels like it's not committing to the bit. And I also feel like mm. I love Carla Gugino's performance in here, but I feel like the writing is not up to the level of her performance. There's something a little uh, short on it. Uh, I, I am surprised how much I'm digging it because the moments that work fucking work. There have been a couple of times where the ending shot, like the twist at the end of the episode, I did not yeah. expect that there's a dipshit that turns around and shoots at her yeah. uh, in the middle of a uh, gig. It's really, yeah. I think it's in like yeah. the second or third episode. I love shit like that. That was great. Like watching her, the parts where she's Parker, I love. I mean, she's not. Yes. I, I can't stress enough that this is not an adaptation of a Richard Stark novel, but. No. <laughs> uh, but the parts where she's that kind of thief for me, yeah. I love it. Yeah. And uh, and also, um, whoever the fuck did the end credits? Yeah, the end shit. credits are fun. Yeah. The end credits are perfect. I I also I gotta say, Giancarlo Esposito is not really holding it down here. I don't think he's vetted. He's not. He doesn't have a sense of menace that I think he needs to they're be this role. They're playing him so much friendlier, and meanwhile, yeah. they're playing his son as a straight up psychopath. Yeah. Oh. Part of the other reason that the male gaze of this show feels weird to me is that I feel like it's slightly misogynistic, or, or it's misogynistic to Jet, uh, it, and it is also. I know he's not. They make it clear uh, that that the son is not exactly gay. He's just a rapist. Yeah. Like it's not no. about sex. It's just power. Yeah. This used to be the like uh, villain uh, stereotype. Like all the villains were like gay British dudes. Uh, that were like imposing their will upon you, uh, and that like the twirly mustache guy, you know, that were perfectly manscaped and groomed. Uh, this is like the um, what's that? Not Snowfall, but the Wire version of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He I just does I, it for the power. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on this show wondering if I needed to get a second opinion about whether or not this was okay or bad. Like yeah, I, um, I am not in the communities that I think this show might be fucking with. I am yeah. not a woman, and and I am not a, a gay man, and I feel like this show puts, particularly in the in the gay man category, puts a fucking terrible character on screen. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely, and, and I know that's not what they're trying to say, but you, yeah. you don't have the luxury sometimes of uh, of showing a great cross section of people. And, Here's and the they've, thing: they've made, I, I think, if they, it's the threat. I think if they committed to the bit more, if everybody was dark, if they did what like to say what Better Call Saul does or what or what Breaking Bad does, where it's like no, when it's bad, Joe it's bad. Joe written this. Joe Lansfield. Mm. There's so many ways this could have worked. There's so many different tones, and I feel like where they land is this weird. It is the Cinemax thing. It is like it's a little bit too lurid and not in a fun pulpy way, but in a this feels a little gross way to me. And, you I, know, and also it's of... long. Yeah. Um, I was kind of getting Weeds vibes if uh, Weeds wasn't as fun. Yeah, I can, I can see, see that. that. I can, I can see, that. see that. Yeah. Yeah. 
because I was uh, like, only, oh, oh my God, all these Jet terms are kind now, of the same sure. as weeds, but like the way we got here isn't like you know smoking pot and like you know hanging out with uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Kevin Nealon. I'm just yeah, imagining yeah. Jet being phenomenally bad at this job and getting everyone around her killed. <laughs> but you know what, Mary Louise Parker pr- had a sort of set of power and direction that I think Jet doesn't have, and that's that's a shame because Mary Louise Parker was a homemaker who got forced into being a kingpin and jet is supposed to be this professional criminal who this has been her life and like a scion of another professional criminal yeah like, like she's the kid of another like they're only putting up with her and not being super gross to her like when she meets frank and stuff uh because of who her lineage is yeah uh but yeah it i, I feel wanted... like i've not finished out the season and i feel like where we're going the reason the cops are there is so that she's got this extra Chekhov's gun on the board that she can aim at and fire at the. I mean, she's setting everybody up against each other in a big triangle that she's right. going to step out of and let them res dogs all shoot each other. Yeah. But, or, you know, it could be a cool misdirect with the cops. Is we just see the stakes get raised when like her safety net is pulled out from underneath her. She finds the two of them dead. Yeah, you know, something like that. Like, I here. feel like they're totally there entirely to be used later as a as a chip to either move mm-hmm. the plot forward or something, which makes me not give a fuck about them as characters. <laughs> yeah. and it makes it feel a little extra heavy. I just, uh, but I honestly, I'm not going to finish. not powerful right now. I'm not going to finish this. I, I got four episodes in and it's, it didn't grab me enough to finish. And I love Carla Gugino. Like she is one of my favorite actresses and I and think she's great here, but I'm mostly disappointed. It, it, it flirts enough, uh, across the line of, of oceans and, uh, and Parker for me that I will probably finish this out. Uh, I, I'm enjoying it, but there's a lot of problems with it, and it's not going to be one of those shows that I'm going to recommend to everybody and, and want to go rewatch. And I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's got the production value, it's got the uh, setup, the cast, the hook. I, I, it just it's not quite the show I want. And there's and maybe it's the Cinemaxness of it. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, there is something a little midnight, yeah, pulpy. But I mean, I've liked midnight pulp crime before. Yeah, me too. Um, me too. I think it's it's that they're not committing. You're right. It's that they're not committing to the bit. If this were straight up midnight, Cinemax, Shannon Tweed murder mystery. Yeah. Fuck it, I'd be in. If this were entirely about a thief who's trying to get out of the life because of a kid. I'm not as interested in that show, but it would work better than this. That if it's got bold. the quirks, if it's got the quirks in like a Tarantino thing, it would work. Like it just, it doesn't. But, but it's 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 humorless in its quirks. Yes, it is. Uh, it is not entirely softy. Uh, you know, this is us, and I'm not a thief anymore. Uh, but it's not Parker. Yeah, it's yeah. it's trying to be all of it, and I'm not entirely sold on the show that it is. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I come down to. All right, well, guys, uh, that about wraps it up for us this time. I think since we have a, a shorter-than-usual show, we're going to give a little teaser of our uh, Patreon this week. So after we get through the next break, you will hear the first uh, segment of our tribute to Keanu Reeves' Patreon. and uh, Johnny yeah, we, Utah himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cut that off, and then you can uh, go listen to the rest of it if you're a patron. You can listen Johnny to the Johnny style, we're going to beam it straight into all of your heads. <laughs> like that YouTube album. Johnny's. <laughs> but uh yeah so that that's gonna come up after the break and uh we'll be back next week with more uh thank you Les. thank you kyle thank you randy. thank you randy thank you to all our listeners and all our patrons and until next time tv news out, out. Whoa, dudes, it's like totally a Keanu tribute. Whoa. 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 So Strange we got... things are afoot on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talking about uh, Bill and Ted's because Bill and Ted Facing Music is coming out. We were excited about that. And we're looking at the timing of it. We're like, oh, we could, we could do this as a Patreon. And then uh, Kyle was like, well, you know... If Bill and Ted, we do Excellent Adventure one week and Bogus Journey, we need one more because to get us to that uh, that hump of when Face the Music gets released. 
And he's like, why don't we do a Keanu episode? Which I think is a great idea. Most excellent. Most um, excellent. And, I mean, and there's plenty of just ancillary stuff. It's a lot shorter conversation about what Alex Winter's been up to, but... Uh, <laughs> But there's a, I mean, there's a lot of ancillary Bill and Ted stuff to discuss before we get into the specific movies, right? Uh, right. And Keanu's career in general. So I, uh, I, I want to talk real quick. Keanu, uh, I looked up, I looked up Keanu's IMDb, and there's some stuff I did not know. This dude is super multicultural. So like, he was born in Beirut in 1984, which is a bad time to be born in Beirut, by the way. Wow. Really um, not lots of great times to be. That's, born. that's that fair. now is a bad time to also be yeah, born in, in Beirut. for sure. <laughs> He's got uh, British, Portuguese, Native Hawaiian, and Chinese ancestry, and he grew up in New York with his mom. Uh, and then like this, this dude is like he's got this like American stoner vibe to him, but he's got a lot more to him. And it, it makes sense as you watch his career go on. It's like, Oh, he had more to show us, but early on, I mean, I don't know about you guys. I liked him in Bill and Ted's, but then after that, I was like, I fell into the, well, this guy's a wooden actor. He's terrible. Please stop putting him in movies. I want to watch. I mean, exactly. when he showed up in much ado about nothing, I was like the fuck, please don't <laughs> ever put him in a Shakespeare movie again. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, he's talked about it in years since like it, he wanted to be able to do it. Uh, yeah. I mean, and and I, I think Keanu maybe just the age and and growing up with him, he's the actor I think of and the first actor I think of where I had to purposely recalibrate like how I was thinking of him on screen, Same. where I watched him in his career on my screen get better at his job. Yeah. Same. What about you, Kyle? Where where did you first discover the Keanu? So I th- I want to say I. I was in this, like, awkward age. I may have told the story before, but uh, I was going to a daycare, but I was, like, the oldest kid at the daycare. And they had this shelf of, like, Barney and, like, kids' tapes and stuff. And there was this one tape. It was Point Break. <laughs> and I probably watched Point Break every day I was there. Like, if I had the, the TV to myself, it was the only thing I had. Wait, how so old I were you? I loved the movie. Man, I would have probably been maybe, like, four or five. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, let me look. Let me see what year that came. Out. <laughs> That's so good. VHS. Holy shit! Like if the I options like... are "I love you," "You love me," or "Let's go rob a bank," <laughs> I feel like we're seeing Kyle's secret origin here. I feel like yes, we're learning we a lot about Kyle today. I'm learning a lot about. I would have Kyle. been six years old, so this is. I was probably seven. <laughs> so uh, when the VHS release came so out. So when I was six or seven, my dad. This is God. Hopefully, the statute of limitations is done on this. My dad rented <laughs> Top Gun. And borrowed a second VCR, and then went to a Radio Shack and bought the gold-plated cables, and uh, and then yeah. we, uh, I was underage, so he dubbed uh, <laughs> Top Gun seven or eight times for friends of his, <laughs> and so as a kid, like it was the greatest moment ever. As like a movie nerd kid, where like Top Gun was on loop for a whole weekend in yeah. my house, <laughs> well, and, and I, I, I watched you're... most of those entrance instances. You had to record it at the same speed. Yes, you were it was yes, a one to one play. Yeah, yeah, you, you couldn't like, yeah, you couldn't. You had to rewind. Like my job was to rewind it and hit play again and make sure that it didn't <laughs> fuck up. Well, I hope you don't get in trouble with that because I know that those seven or eight copies of, of Top Gun probably cost a lot of money to Paramount. That's why that movie didn't turn a profit. <laughs> it is. It's why it's it's really nobody nobody talks about it anymore. Don Simpson had to return his penile implant. <laughs> <laughs> because we did that. So, um, they uh, in, in the little IMDb uh, like mini, mini bio I was reading through, it says his first big role is Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but that is not true. Because first it's the of first all, time I really noticed him, but yeah, he'd been in other stuff. First of all, I would like to call him out as the biker in the Coca Cola Coke is a video short from 1984. Actually, I wouldn't, but I love that that's like his first credit on IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> He'll always be the love interest in the Rush video for. <laughs> um, so, but the the first thing I noticed on here though is that movie called River's Edge that mm-hmm. he was that he was with in with Crispin, Crispin Glover. Glover and Ioni Sky. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, it's it's sort of like teen noir, right? Yeah, there's a, yeah, that's there's a good like, way to put it. There's uh, like a murder uh, and noir drugs. on an outward bound camp out. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I remember that you know. That, that he was seen as like one of these edgy guys like River Phoenix or one of those guys. And then uh, there's Babes in Toyland, which I've not seen, but Les, you were talking about that a little bit. It's a everyone should, if it's still, I don't know that it's still on mm-hmm. Amazon Prime. I think it probably is. Everyone should go watch 15, 20 minutes, every, well, however far along you can make it. Uh, <laughs> the movie was not intended <laughs> to be this bad. 
but it is. <laughs> then he is uh, Chris Townsend in a little movie in 1988 called Permanent Record. Permanent, Permanent Record. record. Yeah, which I, which I assume is probably where uh, Mike Moody and Grant Davis got the name for the studio. No, yeah, uh, Keanu plays the Grant character. Big Keanu fans. <laughs> Uh, no, but, Keanu plays both characters split screen. <laughs> yes. Uh, but then he's in Dangerous Liaisons in 1988, which is also pretty notable. Like, I know I saw him in that. Oh, yeah. He's one of the pretty boy liaisons. Yeah. Uh, but then in 1989, we get Bill and Ted's Excellent Little Adventure, where he is Ted Theodore Logan. And he was he was perfect in that role. Like, he, oh my is, God. he is great. There's, I mean, there are so many. Uh, so Ed Solomon has talked so much about the making of this movie, especially just recently. If, if you go follow him on social media, uh, he has posted all of their handwritten legal pad pages of, <laughs> of the days they spent sitting, writing this in restaurants and shit and like over beers. Uh, I mean, just all of the notes about it in the course of writing this third movie. But he tells a story about uh, being in the casting process. They had seen Keanu. They had seen Alex winner. Uh, they they knew they liked them, but they liked a lot of people. I mean, they were all casting for this. They were, there were a lot of people that were good, and they uh, Solomon and I think Chris, the the other writer, um, had gone out to lunch and were in a friggin' McDonald's or something, <laughs> and there were these two dipshits in front of them in line, just ordering their food and and fucking with each other and laughing at stuff. And and Solomon was like, "It's so it's those guys. Like that's this." This is what we're casting for. And yeah. then they got back and realized, like, oh, shit, that's Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter. We've we've seen both those guys, those guys <laughs> then. <laughs> but, like, they literally saw them out off the set, like, hanging out in a McDonald's in between shit. And we're like, oh, my God, you guys just are. Oh, that's Ted. funny. <laughs> um, so the well, Bill and Ted, we'll talk a lot about Bill and Ted, but I, I want to say real quick before I forget. Bill and Ted feel like uh, of a piece with the later 1990s uh, Beavis and Butthead and also Saturday Night mm-hmm. Live's uh, 1990s um, uh, Wayne's World. Wayne and Garth. Yeah. 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 Uh, Beavis and Butthead are like the more sociopathic version of them, the dumber, slightly yeah. dumber. <laughs> Part of what I love about Bill and Ted is that they, they're so they're just so sweet natured. They're sweet natured. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in that they're same... They're harmless. <laughs> in that same year... Uh, he also played, uh, or right before, yeah, right now the same year, he played Todd in Parenthood, where I think he's like just the one of the kids, <laughs> one of the kids, right? Yep. No, he's uh, he's the idiot boyfriend, I think. Who gets somebody pregnant? Kids. Is that right? I don't yes. remember. I, I've, I've never yes. seen Parenthood. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's been years, but yeah, if I remember right, he's the idiot boyfriend that gets the daughter pregnant. But it's basically the same character. Yeah, I mean, and that's what we all thought he could do. He played yeah. idiot boyfriend, yeah, and, idiot and, friend. And for a while, that's what we thought, and then. Uh, two years later, 1991, he does Point Break. Yes! And, ju- and dives into action. And seven-year-old Kyle's mind is blown. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm if I'm thinking back to it, I may have seen Bill and Ted after this. Like, <laughs> I think I may have seen Point Break first, well, and then later, like, came to Bill and Ted. Um, you're like, yeah, hey, no. what's that stoner dude, dude doing? And what's what's my FBI guy doing playing a stoner, yeah. a stoner rock band? He must be undercover again. He's undercover. This, was, this will be exactly. Johnny Utah. Johnny Utah time cop. <laughs> no, Point I watched that. Has everything though. It's got surfing. It's got skydiving. It's got guns. It's got funny little Halloween masks it's of presidents that I don't even know of because I'm got, seven. It's got Tank like, Girl and Gary Busey. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh no, this. It. Oh. I, wa- I just watched some clips like leading up to this, and the excitement was like uh, overflowing. I was like, I gotta watch this movie again, uh, kind of soon. Is this Catherine Bigelow's first movie? Point Break, I believe it might be. Because Catherine Bigelow's great. I love her, and I love Near Dark that she did. And this was, I here's the funny thing. I am a big '80s action guy, and I am shocked for somehow this slipped past my radar. I never saw it until like maybe five years ago, and I thought it held up beautifully. Uh-huh. Like I really enjoyed it. Um, no, she did. St- yeah, so Near Dark was first, or before oh, that. She okay, did, Near Dark. She was did first. The Loveless, then Near Dark. There's okay. A long gap. Uh, then she did Blue Steel with Lori Petty and uh, Point Break. Man, 91 was a good year for Keanu because Not after. Lori Petty, he- Jamie Lee Curtis, and Blue Steel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after he did, uh, after he did Point Break, uh, he did Bill and Ted's Bogus, Bogus Journey, same year. Uh, which, when I saw it, I thought, and we'll talk about this, but I thought Bill Bogus Journey wasn't anywhere near as good, but now it kind of sits very close to the other one for me. Mm-hmm. Same. Uh, At the time, like more I, so I was than thrown Ghostbusters, by it. 
More, though, than uh, Ghostbusters 2. Yeah, Ghostbusters 2 has also grown in my estimation a little bit, but it's definitely a much weaker movie. Like, it's not I, even I love Ghostbusters mm-hmm. 2, but it felt like two fran- two different franchises. Like, yeah, if you told yeah. me that was a reboot, I'd have believed it as a kid. <laughs> uh, and, and Bogus Journey at least felt like a continuation. It just made me realize mm-hmm. for the first time in my young life that um, watching things get older might suck. And then yeah. also in 91, he does Gus Van Zant's uh, My Own Private Idaho yes. with uh, River Phoenix. And, and that I, is at a, the time, this felt like a naked bid for credibility when all we thought he could do was be uh, for like sure. skinnier Joey Lawrence. For sure. I've never seen and this. You Have know you seen it? Yes, it is. Uh, so I watched every movie where anyone did heroin ever. <laughs> <laughs> I so can't weird. stress enough. I, I I watched I've I've seen every shitty drug movie from the eighties <laughs> and nineties and no uh, lie and I hate uh, this fucking movie but this movie has a really fun credit in Keanu's lineup which was on he did, talked about this on one of like the Q and A's but this is like one of the few movies where he's actually riding the motorcycle uh, like hmm. he all his characters are constantly on motorcycles but it's it's fake it's like you know stunt teams and stuff like that's not really him on the motorcycle. But in this one, he's like, there's this one clip where I get to pull the bike around, and that's really me riding the bike. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Gus Van Zant tells a story about Reeves uh, making this movie. Uh, well, just about Reeves in general, that apparently he carries a tiny notepad. If you tell him a book or something that you recommend, he will write it down. And that you should bank on the fact that the next time you see Keanu Reeves, there is a good chance that he will have actually read that book. Huh. Uh, so, so and that, that he's... And that Gus Van Zant gave all of the actors my own private Idaho because that movie's based on a book. And like, here is the book of the movie we're making. And that River Phoenix was like, cool, and made it like 20 pages in and was like, fuck reading that. Mm-hmm. And Keanu <laughs> read it and like came back to Van Zant and was like, so this, 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 and this. And like, well, holy and, shit, dude, you're you're Ted. And that's the thing mm-hmm. we learned about this as he's as he's going on, and we'll, and we'll get into this. We could talk about his career, but the the things I've I've heard about Keanu Reeves is that he is very considerate. So of course you give him mm-hmm. a book, he's going to read it, and also that like like you said, he was trying to improve his craft from the very start. Like he did not want to be the stoner guy who could who was like the wood the wooden board for his entire career, and he does have like Nicolas Cage, he has a style. Like when you get Keanu, you know what you're going to get. But yes. like Nicolas yeah. Cage, it's also a thing where you probably start to find an affection for it. And I think as he went on, that definitely became became the case. Um, there's a bit in Point Break where he he tells his boss like he's like, "Yes, sir. Today I surfed my first wave." And it's like only Keanu, we- Keanu Reeves could have developed, could have delivered that line in that way. Yeah. Huh. Uh, yeah, so- and I feel like as I got older, I I recognized that what I thought of as just standard acting or normal acting, uh, or or even great acting. Brando's a fucking weirdo and has yeah. a style that he won't let go of in every movie. Like yeah. all of our great – and so I don't know why I, I – there was a moment where I realized I am holding my peer group actor, like my age group actors to a different standard than these uh, legendary older act, you know. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like Richard Burton didn't show up and do Richard Burton in every fucking movie. Right. Um, and that Keanu's got this – different style it's not method it's not what like it he's a blank slate there was some quote from billy bob thornton of like i'm gonna eat the sandwich the same way in every scene no matter what my character's motivation is if the script says i eat a sandwich it's just i'm just gonna eat a sandwich (laughs) you being the director choosing when to you're gonna show the audience me eating a sandwich and then you're gonna show them something else Mm -hmm. whatever that is that's what people are gonna think was my acting like yeah. you're controlling this. I am just another object in the room eating the fucking sandwich. Mm-hmm. And that's how it's kind of how I feel about Keanu. Like he takes himself out of it. Yeah, I get that. I get that. So he, he also ref- makes him seem wooden as fuck sometimes. He did. So, uh-huh. uh, he did Bram Stoker's Dracula, which he was Jonathan Harker, which I still feel like I, I like Bram Stoker's Dracula, but I feel like he was miscast really badly. for he, this. I felt like he was, his mm-hmm. accent comes and goes and it breaks yeah. it. It, it broke the disbelief for me a couple times. And then he also that same year did Much Ado About Nothing, which I think, unless you talked about a little bit, was that off mic or was it the top of the show you talked about? That was off mic. I, I also, at the time, I got, I was like, why the fuck is he in this? Yeah. Like, yeah. like it started getting me mad. of like, hey man, your bid for Oscar cred is wrecking movies. Yeah. Uh, 
And looking back, like I've gone back and watched Much Ado in the last year or so, the the Brenna version, and mm-hmm. it's wonderful. And he absolutely doesn't ruin it. My bringing Bill and Ted forward into it as an audience member was the only thing really wrong with his performance. Right. <laughs> And that's uh, on you, like, Les. Yeah. Seriously, going back and watching this, like he's not as bad as I was mad at him about in, in 1993. Um, and, the, and then in... That 19- same year, he did a favor to what I can only assume is an uncredited, because he's uncredited. He did a favor to Alex Winter and was in Freaked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Freaked is amazing, and everybody should go watch it. And then in 1994, everything changed when he did Speed. The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast out of Austin, Texas. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is done by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to thetvdudes.com. I'm Randy Lander. I'm Les Weiler. And I'm Kyle Scott. Thanks for listening. 